The rumor got about the school. The dead are to return. The buffalo are to return. The Lakota people will get back their own way of life. That part about the dead returning was what appealed to me. To think I should see my dear mother, grandmother, brothers and sisters again. But boy-like, I soon forgot about it. Until one night when I was rudely awakened in the dormitory. Get up! Put your clothes on and slip downstairs. We are running away. A boy was hissing into my ear. Soon fifty of us little boys, about eight to ten, started out across country, over hills and valleys, running all night. I know now that we ran almost thirty miles. There on the Porcupine Creek, thousands of Lakota people were in camp. By the late 1880s, a message of hope spread across the Great Plains. It was called the Ghost Dance, a dance to restore the past when Indian nations were free. They danced without rest, on and on. Occasionally someone thoroughly exhausted and dizzy fell unconscious into the center and lay there dead. The visions ended the same way, like a chorus describing a great encampment of all the Lakotas who had ever died, where there was no sorrow, but only joy, where relatives thronged out with happy laughter. The people went on and on and could not stop. And so I suppose the authorities did think they were crazy. But they weren't. They were only terribly unhappy. Driven off their lands, Indian nations were confined to desolate reservations, dependent on corrupt government agencies for food and supplies. The people were desperate from starvation. We felt that we were mocked in our misery. We held our dying children and felt their little bodies tremble as their souls went out and left only a dead weight in our hands. Red Cloud, Oglala. The ghost dance hurt no one, but as it spread, white settlers panicked. The United States government outlawed the dance. The white men were frightened and called for soldiers. We had begged for life, and the white men thought we wanted theirs. On a mild day just after Christmas of 1890, a band of Hokwoju Sioux, under their leader Bigfoot, left the Cheyenne River Agency in South Dakota, heading for a meeting at Pine Ridge with Oglala leader Red Cloud. Traveling with Bigfoot were 106 men and 252 women and children. Among them was a boy, Dewey Beard, who would later tell his children and grandchildren about that day. Grandpa Dewey Beard being the last survivor, I would listen to what he had to say. In a way, it was sad, and yet it's uh, beautiful because it's bringing back history. One thing that he would say is that had the soldiers, had the government left them alone, in time they would have uh, looked outside and seen how things were changing and the change would come about from within the bands. Bigfoot's band was intercepted by the 7th Cavalry. The officer in charge found Bigfoot wrapped in heavy blankets, dying from pneumonia in the back of a wagon. Bigfoot was ordered to make camp along Wounded Knee Creek. In the morning, his people would be stripped of their weapons and escorted to Pine Ridge. Bigfoot made assurances of his peaceful intentions, and the band made camp. He's a peaceful man. He's, he's always say that uh, 
think about the elderly, think about the children and the woman. And uh, don't start the trouble. Morning broke after a sleepless night surrounded by soldiers. Hok Woju witnesses would later recall what happened next. Bigfoot, who was sick, came up with a flag of truce tied to a stick. Dewey Beard. As soldiers trained their guns on them, Bigfoot and his men brought forth all their weapons, placing them near the white flag of truce Bigfoot had planted in front of his lodge. The soldiers then searched their tents and wagons for arms, even confiscating cooking and sewing tools. As Bigfoot's people gathered around the flag of truce outside his tent, four powerful Hotchkiss rapid-repeating guns were mounted above the camp. I noticed that they were erecting cannons up here, also hauling up quite a lot of ammunition for it. They encircled us like a band of sheep. I could see that there was commotion amongst the soldiers, and I saw on looking back they had their guns in position ready to fire. Thomas Tibbles, a white reporter who followed the troops to Wounded Knee, recorded what happened next. Suddenly I heard a single shot from the direction of the troops. Then three or, or four, a few more, and immediately a volley. At once came a general rattle of rifle firing, then the Hotchkiss guns. An awful noise was heard, and I was paralyzed for a time. Then my head cleared, and I saw nearly all the people on the ground bleeding. My father, my mother, my grandmother, my older brother, and my younger brother were all killed. And he saw his mother walking toward him. She was walking along, and she was shot. Dewey, she said, keep walking, my son. She said, keep going. She said, I'm going to die. And that was the last time he saw his mother. The women, as they were fleeing with their babies, were killed together, shot right through. And after most of them had been killed, a cry was made that all those not killed or wounded should come forth and they would be safe. Little boys came out of their places of refuge, and as soon as they came in sight, a number of soldiers surrounded them and butchered them there. American Horse, Oglala. The firing continued for an hour or two, wherever a soldier saw a sign of life. With the sunset, the weather turned intensely cold. About seven o'clock that night, the 7th Cavalry brought in the long train of dead and wounded soldiers and Indians from Wounded Knee. Forty-nine wounded Sioux women and children had been piled into a few old wagons. The wounded Indian women and children were eventually carried into an agency church where they lay in silence on the floor beneath a pulpit decorated with a Christmas banner reading, Peace on Earth, Goodwill to Men. <laughs> 